Hi, this is Glenn with Crimson Lotus Tea. We are in Lijiang, Old Town. Um, when I say Old Town, it is an old town. Um, this place has uh, been here for more than a thousand years, not these buildings specifically, but um, this township has been here for a very long time. Very deeply integrated uh, history as a uh, trading point for tea and wares going into and uh, out of uh, Tibet uh, <coughs> and uh, Chengdu for that matter. <coughs> Um, we're here because uh, Lamu's grandfather used to work and live here in the 1930s. He actually traded tea between here and Shangri-La. So we're going to show you uh, Lijiang Old Town. We're going to talk about uh, the ancient tea horse road. And we're going to uh, explain, uh, uh, just kind of show you how, how tea got from here to Shangri-La and then further up into, into Tibet. The ancient tea horse road is the name given to the collection of paths that brought tea from Yunnan to uh, Tibet and to, uh, to Beijing and, uh, and other places. Interesting note, um, generally they didn't use horses on the tea horse road, they used uh, mules. Mules are a lot more reliable, uh, they could carry a lot more weight and um, they were uh, less prone to slipping off of uh, dangerous mountain paths. This is a cool, uh, cool statue to the uh, tea horse road that they've got here in Lijiang. Lijiang Old Town is a maze, an absolute maze of uh, small, tiny alleys and just tons and tons and tons of shops. Um, it's fun. It's a lot of fun to explore. It's actually really easy to, uh, it's really easy to get lost, but you can have a lot of fun while you're doing it. Lijiang was built over a handful of natural waterways and they incorporated them into the town. They still run through the town, under the town. They're used, uh, they bring in water and they're used to, uh, to remove waste. Down a bunch of tiny little alleys, there's all sorts of really fun little tiny hotels that you can stay in. Pretty cool. For whatever reason, there are a lot of pink ukulele stores here. And this music... This music is the official song of Lee John. Every single shop that's a music shop in Lee John will be playing this song. It will drive you nuts. Lijiang is definitely uh, touristy. Um, in fact, it's almost entirely in, entirely filled with with uh, with, with tourists. Um, locals do run the shops, but uh, they actually, in most cases, no longer actually own their shops. Uh, once Lijiang was granted a UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, basically what happened is local government. Uh, just skyrocketed all the prices for uh, for rent, drove out all the uh, the local minorities, uh, the Nashi. The Nashi are the ones who uh, who traditionally live here. Uh, basically, kind of drove them all out. They could no longer afford to uh, afford to, uh, to own stores here, and it allowed uh, external investors, primarily from the east coast of China, to come in and uh, buy everything up. Um, but then they rehired all the original people to operate in the stores that <laughs> they used to own. Uh, it's it's a little bit little bit sad, um, but Lijiang's Lijiang's still awesome. Uh, culturally, it's really cool. It just it, it, the the buildings are gorgeous, and um, you do only have about six or seven different types of uh, different types of stores though. You got people uh, a lot of silver shops. You've got music shops selling drums. You got a lot of tea shops, which is really really cool to see. It's a nod to the uh, original history of uh, Lijiang as a uh, as a tea trading resort. Most of the tea coming into Lijiang came from the Shaoguan Dali area. This would have been a gathering point and they would have uh, repackaged the tea and uh, hired out mule teams to bring it uh, to Shangri-La and also to, uh, to Chengdu. After leaving Lijiang, the tea would have uh, headed uh, northwest, would have gone over the uh, Jade Dragon Snow Mountain Pass and then, uh, and then over the Yangtze River. I could keep filming video on Lijiang all day. Lijiang is uh, uh, it, it's, it's a really great place to visit. Uh, even if it is super touristy. Uh, it is expensive. Um, the main gates to Lijiang Old Town will charge anyone who is not a local uh, significant amounts of money. But, a little pro tip, 
Uh, you can park your car or sneak around to some of the back areas, and there's like open streets and back alleys, and you can just kind of like walk into Lee Jong from that way. Uh, it, it's 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 worth like spending the night here if you can stay in one of the old courtyard hotels. They're super awesome. Other than that, um, there's really not a whole lot uh, to do here. It feels a little, honestly, it feels a little culturally void. Uh, there's a really cool town about six kilometers west of here called Shuha, um, which does not feel as touristy. It feels a lot more, a lot more authentic. You see a lot more uh, actual craftsmen. Uh, you'll see people outside here, um, outside of the silver shops here, hammering on silver. And if you watch them long enough, you realize that they're just hammering on the exact same piece of silver all day long. Nothing is actually made here. Uh, feels a lot like maybe like you could call it like an Epcot Lee Jung experience. Uh, it's still fun, it's still worth it. Um, so from here we're gonna go uh, continue to follow the, uh, the T-Horse Road Northwest. We're gonna check out the, uh, the crossing of the, uh, the Yangtze River and then move up into uh, Shangri-La. Uh, Lamu's grandfather um, on her mother's side worked, um, worked uh, for uh, a few summers, a few years uh, in his teens as a, as a T-Horse uh, trader, uh, a mule trader. Uh, carried tea between uh, Lijiang and uh, in Shangri-La in that area. So we're gonna uh, we're traveling with him right now. And we're going to um, go to a couple places that he remembers. Uh, this is a long time ago. It was in the late 30s, uh, late 30s, early 40s. So it was, uh, it was an interesting time for China, right about the time of the uh, beginning of the, the Japanese occupation, pre-World War uh, II, before everything got started there. So it was an interesting time to be around here. And the Tea Horse Road was still a, a critical path to uh, to move stuff in and out. Um, so I'm going to show you this, uh, the first section that we're at right here. This is the Yangtze River. It, uh, it's the lifeblood of Yunnan, winds its way all the way through, it starts up in the uh, uh, northwest corner up in the Himalayas. And uh, it's a really beautiful area around here. It would have looked uh, significantly different, you know, 75 years ago. Uh, back up in this direction is Dali. Dali is where Shaoguan is, so most of the tea originating, uh, most, most of the tea heading to uh, Tibet would have originated in, in Shaoguan. Um, this is where the paths diverged after leaving uh, Dali with the tea. They would have come up around here to the Yangtze River and they would have split to the left and they would have headed straight into uh, the Shangri-La Diching area and they would have headed to the right uh, into, uh, into Lijiang. Um, the, the left route goes around the river and it's a really direct, uh, direct path uh, direct path into Tibet, but the other tea going into, uh, into uh, Lijiang would have um, been able to be consumed in Lijiang and then uh, maybe repackaged going up to Chengdu uh, or over to, uh, over to, over to Shangri-La. Around this bend of the river is a fairly important town called Shugu. That's one of the uh, the, the first gathering points outside of uh, outside of Dali for uh, for tea heading into uh, into Tibet. Um, we can't see the town from here, but it's there. We're much further north now. This is the part of the, uh, the Yangtze River that actually flows north. Uh, Shugu, the town that uh, I showed you a minute ago, uh, is at the first bend of the Yangtze River. The Yangtze River does something really interesting where it actually it flows south and then it flows north and then it flows south again. So we're in the north flowing, uh, north flowing side. We're actually on the Tibet side of the Yangtze River. On the other side is uh, uh, Lijiang. Lijiang is way over this mountain pass. This mountain pass is Yulong Shui Shan. It's Jade Dragon Snow Mountain. So tea coming into Tibet through this route would have gone through the uh, Jade Dragon Snow Mountain uh, through that pass and it would have come down to here. This is a place called Wujaran. Wujaran means five family area. Traditionally five families lived in this area. This bridge is new uh, relatively. It was made in, uh, made in the early 70s um, but in uh, her grandfather's time this would have been a rope ferry system. All the tea and the people would have been on uh, the ferry and uh, the mules would have been um, just swimming along uh, on the side. 
And so this was a, a critical, uh, critical point for them to cross. This is one of the easier points for them to cross. If you get further north from here, uh, it gets really, really narrow and the river is super, super tough. Um, that's the Tiger Leaping Gorge area. It's an incredibly gorgeous area, but it's very difficult to cross the river there. So this is where they crossed to get into um, what was traditionally the autonomous area of Tibet. And then they would move up into, uh, into Shangri-La and Diching and Lhasa from there. After the river crossing, the tea traders would have made their way up and through this mountain pass to uh, the Diching, Shangri-La area. It would have been a lot of work, but the views are incredible. There's multiple routes. Um, on the east side of this valley, on the other side, is the old, uh, the old highway to Shangri-La. They built the new highway on the west side where we're shooting this from. There's a lot of people that live up in this area now. There wouldn't have been as many back in the tea trading days. Mule teams that made it through the mountain pass would have been greeted with some really incredible views. This is the south end of uh, the Diching, Zhongdian, Shangri-La Valley area. The valley extends for about another uh, 60 kilometers until you reach Shangri-La town itself. This is pretty high altitude, uh, probably above 10,000 feet right now. You can tell from my breath, I'm a little out of breath. Uh, it is noticeable, physical exercise, exertion, uh, even at this altitude. This area is really incredible. Uh, it's a fertile valley. You can grow a lot of awesome stuff here, primarily barley. Barley, they grow a lot. Um, maybe even see the town of Shangri-La itself is about another day's journey for the mule team uh, north through the valley in this direction. Travel at this point wouldn't have been too difficult. It's fairly flat all the way. We're a few kilometers north of Shangri-La at the Songseling Monastery. This is the uh, largest Tibetan Buddhist monastery in all of Yunnan. It's been here since the uh, 1600s. Um, this place was one of the two places where tea was traded in Shangri-La. So uh, you had Shangri-La downtown, which is now Shangri-La Old Town, and, the, uh, and this monastery. Despite what you may think, monks generally have a decent amount of money, and in this area, the monks paid uh, paid the best for the tea that was brought in. Um, the monks would uh, would gather the tea. They would use the tea themselves, but primarily they were gathering the tea in preparation for uh, treks into Tibet. Um, the journey from here into into Lhasa. Uh, could only happen one or two times a year. So the, the mule teams who would come and trade their tea here, uh, the monks would gather it, they would store it, they would keep it for a while. Um, and then once the, the, the weather and the passes were clear, the monks would actually lead their own, uh, their own mule teams up into, uh, into the mountains. The monastery is really pretty. It's similar to the, the Potala Palace in Lhasa. Uh, it's interesting to think about how much tea history would have gone through, would have gone through this area. Um, the mule teams that would have left here going into Lhasa would have been significantly larger uh, only because they would have done just a couple, couple trips per year. So once the tea made it into, uh, into the Shangri-La Diching area, it would have gone to uh, one of two places. It would have gone to the Songsala Monastery or it would have come here to, uh, to Shangri-La Old Town. Shangri-La Old Town is pretty awesome. It looks about like it's probably looked for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, it's really cool, old style Tibetan, uh, Tibetan architecture. Uh, about four years ago, there was a pretty big tragedy and a significant portion of Old Town actually burned down. They've been working really hard in the meantime, working on, uh, on getting it redone, uh, rebuilt. Uh, here's an example of it. Um, they rebuild it with uh, traditional traditional architectural building techniques make everything look uh, look exactly like it would have done. They do a really amazing job. Um, so they've been rebuilding it and it's it's awesome. So if you look down here at the stone, uh, rumor is that these uh, this is actually where tea uh, mules would have uh, would have walked. These stones have been here for uh, for a very long time. Uh, after arrival and after the tea had been traded. Uh, there would have been an opportunity to relax. Uh, the mules would have been allowed to uh, to graze in the fields and um, fatten up for the uh, the return trip back to Lijiang. They would have uh, uh, traded their tea 
Uh, they would have also tried to, to get different materials. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here. This is the other end of uh, the the T-horse road from uh, from India. So they would have tried to uh, uh, trade in for um, from different stuff, stuff from Lhasa, Tibetan fabrics, uh, Indian fabrics, Indian goods and stuff that they could bring back to uh, to Lijiang and sell at that end. So it was a continuous loop. Uh, this whole this this whole area, it, it really took it took only like less than a week to get from Lijiang here, and then a week to to get back. So there was basically a continuous continuous trade uh, nearly year round. Uh, it would stop uh, during inclement weather during uh, during the winter season, or if the weather was uh, the water was really 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 high during um, during the summer seasons. But otherwise, it was almost uh, almost continuous trade uh, back and forth year round. Um, so this is uh, this is Lamu, and this is Lamu's grandfather. Uh, Lamu's grandfather worked on the the, the T horse road as a uh, uh, as, as a teenager in in the 1930s. And we're going to uh, to talk with him and ask him some questions. He's going to tell us about his experiences. Yeah. My grandpa is uh, 90 years old now, and uh, he participated paid a partial of the tea horse road or he was uh, 13 to 16 years old yeah how many days did he um how many days did it take to go from lijiang to shangri-la 13 four days four days mm -hmm. four days did they did they stay they stayed in villages or did they camp there's no village camping you, you free, you to go. There is a place that have a water. You find uni. And there, you know, lots of things, so they can camp in there. Did they bring? Uh, they brought all their own food with them, or did they hunt? Uh, bring the own food. No place for hunting. So did they have to bring the food for the animals as well? So no, uh, they don't need to bring anything. They find a place with uh, the food, grass, grass, then they just uh, have lunch there or they paint camping there. So. so how many how many mules would be on their trip? <laughs> You you Oh, so, he, so he walked. Yeah. The boss was riding a horse. Okay. The rest people, the rest people if you riding a horse, uh, then were to carry the stuff. The people is walking. Yeah. So did he also have to carry things as well? No. So so did, put it on the horse. Did they carry more than just tea to trade from Lijiang? Sugar, brown sugar. Oh, sugar cane. Oh, So some of the food powder. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, okay. Um, was, was it was uh, was were bandits ever, ever a concern? Uh, so he hadn't finished the question. So okay. those are stuff for bring all the way to Tibet. But for you know, bring local people, they bring salt, salt, uh, clothes, uh, fabric, uh, okay. and so on. Uh, so, so three things for the oh, tea horse road. Uh, so tea, sugar, and those uh, food powder is the main. Sweet chocolate. Okay. Uh, so those uh, those food powder it's called uh, rice noodle or something. Uh, maybe I can share later. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Okay.
Oh, did was he? Did he help? Did he help the packing, or did people pa pack the tea uh, in in Lijiang? And what was what was his his role exactly? Uh, uh, he didn't participate in anything. Uh, they packed her from Xiaoguan. Okay, so everything is pre-packed in Xiaoguan and they just transferred it from mule to mule to mule. I think so. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So when they when they got to Shangri-La, when they got to Dichin, he took his tea to the uh, the, the monastery, is that correct? Uh, so, so I think uh, so where he think uh, he uh, because uh, in that the temple they store it there and then they also have uh, such a big food for gra uh, grass for the mm -hmm. meal to okay. eat that's why they will stay there for a oh. couple of weeks to make a uh, meal grow fatter oh, okay Okay, so the journey, the journey is really tough, the, 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 the four-day journey. Oh, uh, so only one trip to Tibet for um, a year. Only spring go to Tibet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before autumn they will come back, before the snow block the road. Yeah. Because tough road. Yeah. yeah. He didn't go on the, the part from uh, Dichin to Lhasa. No, no So how, how many times a year did he make the trip from Lijiang to Shangri-La <laughs> to Lijiang? So I think uh, from here to Lijiang is very often for him. He was a kid that time he doesn't go that often. So every day people go and they people come back. Because they need to bring their living food, salt, tea, everything. So there was constant, constant trade between Lijiang and Shangri-La. Primarily also because the, it's easier, the weather is better between here and there. So very important since uh, know the time, uh, time and season. Winter is uh, very hot. Summer too much rain. No water, no bridge, so they cannot come here to Tibet. So before the water race. So you have to go to Tibet between summer and autumn. You have to come back. Based on the season. So when when you would when you would be traveling, was it uh, primarily traveling with Tibetans, or were there different uh, different uh, ethnicities that you would work with? As long as uh, you are business uh, people want to do business, you are on a 
Tibet,拉斯曼尔,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就是这个,就